Good morning and welcome to Tribuco Canyon Community Church. It's been a crazy morning, but God's good. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here in person or outside or watching at home online. Uh, for those of you at home, we're praying you can join us soon. Uh, let's worship the triune God this morning. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Lord, we come this morning to to praise you. You call us from the ends of the earth to to lift our voices in song to you, and we come to give you thanks for, for your great love and your faithfulness to us. You're a good and gracious God. We, we come to praise you and give you thanks for, Lord, your gift of creation and how you made us. We come to praise you and give you thanks for your gift of redemption that we know through the person of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we now come. Be glorified in our midst, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. amen. If you're able, will you stand with us and join us as we sing together, Joyful, Joyful. This song's going to be a little upbeat for you if you're expecting it to be uh, more of a traditional flavor, so it's going to be a little bright. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And so we're talking about creation, and these songs are touching on that. Your voice it thunders. Your voice it thunders. 
the oaks are twisting, the forest sounds with cedars breaking, the waters see you and start their writhing. to declare that in the world today where it feels like, I mean, the world is crazy and fallen, but the Lord is holy. He's in his temple. He's here with us today. We rise up. We just declare, you're above everything. Amen. Sing together, how great is our God. of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness strikes. at his voice. How great is our God. How great is our God.
Would you bow your heads in prayer with me as together we confess our sin before the Lord this morning? Lord, we, we joyfully declare your greatness. We joyfully declare your goodness. But Lord, often on, on a practical level, there are days in which we, we doubt your goodness. When, when you forbid something, there's a part of us that thinks that you're withholding some true pleasure from us. We think the sin that tempts and entices us will bring us more joy than the joy found in being faithful to you. We, like our first parents, think that we can find good and evil for ourselves. Forgive us, Lord. For, forgive us when we know, knowingly do what we know we ought not to do. And forgive us when we fail to do what we know we should. Have mercy on us for Christ's sake as we confess our sin before you now. Lord, we thank you for the assurance of pardon that you give us in your word, that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Praise be to your glorious name. Amen. The sixth song is a, more of a prayer. We're asking for God to speak, preparate, preparing our hearts to hear the words. So speak, O oh Lord. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you, 
to receive the food of your holy word. Test your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, fully reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let the truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we will stand on your promises and by faith couple quick announcements for you um, uh, before we go into our time of intercessory prayer and then dismiss the kids for Sunday school. First, um, if you're a visitor here, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. We've got one of these little connect cards that you can fill out. Uh, it'll help me remember your name. You'll get a little card in the, rem- in the mail. And if you put your email address, uh, we can keep, keep you abreast of the different things that's going on here at church. Um, We've got youth group tomorrow night, college group tonight at 6 p.m. We'll be studying the canon of scripture up here in the fellowship hall. Tuesday morning, we'll continue our book club meeting via Zoom for us men. Men's breakfast is on Saturday, March 13th, uh, this time. And then a prayer meeting Thursday, as well as women's Thursday night Bible study at Debbie Wheeler's home from 7 to 8.30. That's, that's coming up this Thursday, right? This Thursday. Um, also, I've got these wonderful little cards. Do you see these? They're tiny, but they're actually invites for Easter, and, and they're pretty cool. So we've got Good Friday service at 7, celebrate Easter with us, and then our glorious sunrise service at 6.15, outdoors with breakfast following and then the indoor service at 9.30. So um, there are a whole bunch of these on the back. Um, We're happy to invite people to church even in a so-called pandemic. So um, feel free to grab some of these, pass those out and and encourage people. If uh, if there's a time when people need Jesus, I mean, this is the time, right? So so please uh, invite people, encourage them to come and be a part of that. We've got really good food. Normally we make the food this year, um, 
Got a friend who runs a Chick-fil-A. They're, they're helping us out with the yogurts, the Chick-fil-A yogurts. Have any of you had those for breakfast? They're like really good. So we're going to have those. We're going to have some Portos. It's, it's going to be great. And then, um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, let's, uh, before we dismiss the kids off to Sunday school, let's take a moment and, um, and bring our prayers before the Lord. We you bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this day that you have made. Thank you for being a God who tells us to ask and it will be given to us, to seek and we will find, to knock and the door will be opened for us. For everyone that asks receives and he that seeks finds and him who knocks, it shall be opened. So Lord, we, we, we come to you standing on, on that promise that you're a God who hears and answers prayer. You might not always answer it the way we think you should answer it, but you always hear and answer according to your goodness, according to your power, according to your wisdom. Lord, you tell us in your word to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And I, I don't know the cares that are weighing heavy on hearts this morning, I know there are individual cares for provision. You provide abundantly. There there are prayers for healing for the sick. There are prayers for guidance for decisions that need to be made. Lord, we we think of those near and dear to our heart who haven't been able to join us at church for, for whatever reason. Comfort them. Bring them back to us soon. Lord, we pray for our nation and our leaders that they would seek you for wisdom and guidance. That weighs heavy on our heart as well. Hear these and hear all of our prayers for Christ's sake as we bring them before you now. Lord God, you tell us of a um, of a sower who goes out to sow. It's one of the parables of Jesus. And when he goes out to sow, some of the seed falls on rocks and get go- gets gobbled up by birds, and and some of it falls on shallow soil and and appears to take root, but it it withers quickly. But then there's also uh, a seed that finds good, healthy soil and takes deep root and brings about a bountiful harvest. Lord, would that be a picture of our hearts this morning? Whether we're here in the sanctuary listening to your word or whether we're in the fellowship hall in Sunday school, prepare our hearts to receive your word bountifully. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, kids, off to Sunday school. Have fun and the rest of you, if you take your Bibles and open them to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter two, starting in verse four in just a moment. And Michael? Um, I've, I've served in some kind of Bible teaching role since I was a teenager. I, I, I used to teach Sunday school as a teenager. And then as I got older, I started doing youth ministry. And then I started teaching adult Sunday school classes and eventually ended up with a, this church almost ugh, like 19 years ago. Uh, and, and over those decades... There's a question that I've been asked every once in a while, but not nearly as frequently as I think I should be asked. Uh, The question is this, why do I have such a hard time 
reading my Bible. Again, probably over the last almost 30 years of teaching God's word, I might have gotten that question maybe once a year, if that. Do any of you have a hard time reading your Bible? I, I, I think people don't ask the question because they're afraid of the answer that I might give them, right? Pastor Robert, why do I have such a hard time reading your Bible? Well, obviously you're not as spiritual as I am, right? Or, or, or maybe they're afraid of the answer, well, it's because you're lazy and undisciplined. Or, or even worse, they're afraid I might say, well, it's because you probably aren't really saved. Th- those are not the first answers I would give you. I'll be honest, there are days when when I have a hard time reading the Bible. And part of the reason we all have a hard time reading the Bible is because it's a really old book written in ways that we're not used to with language that's that we're not familiar with. And so it, it takes time to learn it. And it's not always easy reading. Some parts are, but many aren't. Now, now we as a 21st century people, we've, we've been brought up with a certain diet of reading. When, when we read things, there's, there's ways in the back of our mind that we anticipate the reading ought to go. And so our tendency is to read with, if you would, 21st century glasses. So for example, if I told you, I'm going to read a song to you, and I read the psalm that we started this morning service off from one seven, Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. You might hear that and say, that's not a song. That might be like a chorus, and it doesn't rhyme. Songs are supposed to last, what, between three and five minutes, Right? That's, that's what we're used to. Guess what? It's still a song. It's just not the kind of song we're used to. And so we have to recognize that as 21st century readers, when we approach the text, we have a whole bunch of expectations. There are details we're expecting the author to give us. Details and structures that we want and anticipate. There's, there's storylines and arcs that we're used to that aren't always organized the way we as 21st century's readers expect. So, for example, we're, we're going to see this really clearly this morning. In just a few moments, I'm going to read all the way through Genesis chapter 2 and 3. It's going to take me about five minutes. Okay, I already timed it. But when we read through Genesis chapter two and three, there's going to be all kinds of details that you want to know that aren't going to be there. Like, um, did Adam have a belly button? Where did this serpent come from? What kind of fruit was it? What's the exact latitude and longitude of the Garden of Eden? And guess what? The text doesn't answer any of those things. We we expect the text to progress in a certain way. And and then when the story ends, we expect it to be tied up with a nice, neat bow because that's what we're used to. And when we read certain stories in the Bible and they're not wrapped up that way, it frustrates us and we don't get it. We want more. So, Genesis chapter two and three is a historical account. It's just not the kind of historical account that we're used to. This morning, we're going to focus primarily on verses four through 17 of chapter two, but I'm going to read the whole passage because I want you to see a larger framework. There's a literary device that you're going to see in this that you're not used to. It's a literary device that's common throughout the scriptures. It's called chiasm. Okay. Say that word chiasm, chiasm. Okay. And, and it's an A, B, C, B, A structure. 
That kind of chiastic structure is used frequently throughout the Bible because for people for whom paper and pen or papyrus and pen was really expensive, it was important to have structures that were easy to memorize. And the chiastic structure leads, lends it toward passing on oral tradition in a way that's memorable and it's really helpful in doing so. So before we read, I, wa- I want you to look on the last page of your song sheet. So I've got an outline. We're actually only covering point one of the outline this morning. But at the end of the outline on the next page, you're going to see this, this funky A, B, C, D, C, B, A structure. And, and this is the structure of Genesis 2 and 3. This is, this is taken from a book by Sidney Gradonis, um, Preaching Christ from Genesis. And this structure is really helpful, and, and you'll see it when we read through it. But look at the structure with me. So first, it's bookended first in Genesis 2-4 with narrative, God, man, from Adama, ground to garden. And then go all the way to the bottom at the end, God, man, from garden to Adama, ground. That's when Adam gets exiled from the garden. Look at the bees. First, narrative. God, man, woman, animals, relationship among creatures. God's goodness in making a partner for man. Then look at the corresponding bee. Monologue. God, man, serpent, relationship among creatures. God's judgment and grace. C, dialogue. Serpent, woman, about eating from the tr- tree. Three statements. C, the other corresponding C, dialogue. God, man, woman, about eating from the tree. Three questions and answers. And then smack dab in the middle, we have the high point or the tipping point of the story itself. Woman, man, they eat from the tree in rebellion against God. So, so that's that, this literary structure that as 21st century readers we're probably not going to pick up on, but we've got good scholarship that helps us see these kinds of things. I, I, I think you, it'll be really clear for you as we read together from Genesis chapter two. And again, I'm going to read chapters two and three. Now I mentioned this is going to take like five minutes to read and you've been standing for worship. So some of you have a harder time standing than others If you do, don't feel compelled, but if you'd like to stand and are able, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of the good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. And there it was separated into four headwaters. The the name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Hivala, Where there is gold, the gold of the land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon, which winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of the Asher. The fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. 
Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they'll become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but did God say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will surely die? You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God when he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is it you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground from, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and also from the tree of life, take and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed On the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way back to the tree of life. This is God's word. You may be seated. Why do we have two different creation accounts? I think for much the same reason we have four different gospels, right? God, God in his providence chose to give an accounting of the life of Christ through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all historical. They're all faithful to Jesus, but all of them have different nuances or emphasis. So too, we have two different creation accounts. They're they're not to be read as sequential, but rather synoptic. 
they, they emphasize different nuances and emphases. And so the first creation account that we've been looking at for the last several weeks was written from a cosmic perspective, right? God brings order into chaos. The earth is formless and void. It's this tohu vavohu and, and God creates in formlessness. He creates forms and then he fills them. So the first three days, God created corresponding forms. And then the last three days, he fills those forms in days four through six. The second account of creation is a much more earthly account from an earthly perspective. It starts off dry and and weedy, untended, and it ends up the same way after the curse, hence those bookends. The first account ends with the creation of man. The second account starts off with the creation of man. And one of the things that you notice in a good movie is that characters are typically introduced for a reason. They're there for a reason to move the plot along or to point you to something if you're paying attention. And I want you to see in this creation account that the characters are more than just God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, but actually the setting itself functions almost as characters to point us to anticipate other things that will be taking place. Again, As I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot more we want to know about the details of creation that just aren't there, but let's look at what is there. We're going to be using this this outline this weekend and next, so this morning we're just covering point number one. Next week we'll be covering points two, three, and four, and then the following message we're going to circle back around and and talk about marriage and the first marriage and, and some lessons we can learn from that. But let's see what's here first in in the scene and the setting for us. The the backdrop is the good and blessed creation. So you remember chapter one, as we read through it, God said it was good. Tov ma'od. It was good. It was very good. And, And three times in chapter one, we see God blessing his work. After the fall, We see three curses. What are we to make of this? Well, we, we, the readers are to understand the nature of things has changed. The world in which we live in isn't the way God created it to be. The way our first parents, Adam and Eve experienced this Edenic garden, this time of innocence That reality is far different from the reality that we live in now. The world in which we live in now is under a curse. A curse that was brought about by the first Adam and his rebellion. But that curse is going to be undone by the second Adam, Jesus Christ, and his obedience. That's the backdrop for the scene in which this drama of creation and fall takes place. And it takes place in a garden in the region of Eden. Now, where is the Garden of Eden? Nobody knows. It was somewhere. So this isn't just symbolic language. It it was an actual place. Some people have have come up with a lot of very exotic guesses. I I won't go through the, the fascinating reading that I went through this week. Um, there's some people who speculate it was actually in Antarctica. There's, there's other who, others who believe it was in China. Uh, there's, there's one person who believes it was on an island in the Indian Ocean. I, I have a dear friend um, who was from Armenia. His name was Zorab Shamasi, and he's now gone to be with the Lord. But I, I remember he gave me a paper, which at least in his mind, proved that the Garden of Eden was, you'll never guess, in Armenia, right? Texas? Yeah, Michael thought it was in Texas. Like a good Texan. Now, the the reason there's so much controversy surrounding its location is because uh, there's no place that matches up 
currently with the description that's given for us in Genesis 1. It mentions, the, it mentions and gives us the picture that, that the Garden of Eden has these headwaters or a spring that flows into these four corresponding rivers. And you look on a map, it's not there, right? Now, that really shouldn't surprise us if we think about it. We, we should expect that things might be topographically different now than they were more than 6,000 years ago, right? This, this may have been when Pangaea was still intact. Uh, this is pre-flood geography. Honestly, Armenia is probably not that bad a guess. Some other good guesses, and I won't go into this. We, we can talk about it in the Fellowship Hall over donuts later. Turkey, Iraq, some have speculated even Jerusalem at one point in time. But, but a lot of scholars believe that it was actually a garden that was elevated because if there's the spring that flows from it as a headwater down into these other rivers, typically those kinds of springs are higher up. Interesting, we can't be sure. But in light of some of the temple language that's used here, I, I don't think it's far-fetched. And, and there is temple language used here. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago for those of you who were here. There's this, this picture of this river, which for us as 21st century people who have indoor plumbing, we don't get that excited about rivers. But, but for people in, in the time of Moses, wandering through the de deserts, rivers were a sign of blessing and prosperity and something to get excited about. There's this language of rare jewels and gold, right? Corresponding with temple language here. Even the name Eden connotates this sense of luxury and abundance. When the temple would later be built by Solomon thousands of years later, it was adorned and decorated with garden-like imagery, as well as precious stones and, and gold. And we see that imagery continued even in the book of Revelation. So let me read to you from Revelation 22, verse 1. It says, Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life as clear, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its, every fru yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So do, do you see this? At the very beginning of the Bible, we have this picture of, of paradise, this idyllic setting where, where man is dwelling with God in, in the garden. There's a sense of ease and luxury, uh, innocence, beauty, abundance. But that state of things has been lost in Adam and Eve's rebellion and disobedience. But at the same time, we're given a promise at the end of the Bible, at the renewal of all things, that there appears that there's not going to just be a restoration of this identic, idyllic existence, but there's going to be something better. There's, there's not just one tree of life, but it's like there's, there's 12 trees of life. There's bearing 12 crops of fruit either side of the street. I don't know how that works, but I, I, I think the language is clear is, is, is there's a magnification. And, and so you have this bookend, the, the bookends of the Bible are gardens. You've got a garden in the very beginning, God dwelling with his people in, it's more of an orchard than what we think of as a garden, I think. And the same thing at the end. In the book of Revelation, as Christians, we recognize that we live in this in-between time, this time in which we look back to what was lost, which gives us the answers for the reason the world's in such a mess that it is. And at the same time, it, the Bible gives us something to look forward to, something to look ahead to, something that's promised to us because of what Christ has accomplished for us. So we see here in this scene of creation, the backdrop of God's good and blessed creation, this, this garden in the river in, in the region of Eden and, and this temple language that's used. 
And then my last point for today is that there's no weeds, just trees. No weeds, just trees. Um, before, oh, dang it. Where is it? I think it's here. Yeah, there it is. Before COVID hit, one of the things we, we had just started trying to implement is, so the first Sunday of the month we had uh, the Lord's Supper, which is what we still practice. The third Sunday of the month we had potlucks, which I'm not sure what that's going to look like coming up, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, and then what we started doing on the fourth Sunday of the month is we used to, we, we started trying to do like a question and answer time where, where if people had questions from the sermon series that we're in from before this month, they could bring their questions or submit it. And, and the very first question we got, I'm, I'm going to share with you because it, it, it's perfectly appropriate. And I, I think I know who wrote this. In Genesis 1, plants were created on the third day. And in Genesis 2, 5, it says no shrub or plant was yet on the earth. Can you explain the sequence? I think it was you, Carrie, right? Yeah, it was you. Um, I recognize the handwriting. And, uh, and so I'm going to answer that. She's been waiting a long time, but, but, but here's the answer. And, and this, is, um, this is from Kent Hughes' commentary on Genesis. Uh, the real answer actually comes from um, Jewish scholar Rabbi Umberto Casuto, uh, whose commentary on Genesis I can't afford. Uh, but Hughes quotes him, so I'm, I'm going to share this with you. So what, what we're talking about is this verse. Look at verse 4. Verse 4, chapter 2, it says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. The no's in these verses tell us why the earth was untended. There was no bush, no small plant, no rain, no man to work the ground. Significantly, day three of creation, which described the earth's production of vegetation, did not include the Hebrew word for bush and small plant. This is because, as Umberto Casudo explains, these species did not exist or were not found in the form known to us until after Adam's transgressions, and it was in consequence of his fall that they came into the world or received their present form. Thus, bushes and small plants were post-fall phenomenon that occurred when Adam began to tend the earth. Indeed, after the fall of Adam, the Lord told Adam regarding the land, thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth to you and you shall eat the plants of the field. The plants of the field were those that would grow under Adam's cultivation. And the bushes, Kasudo equates them with weeds and explains again, In areas, however, that were not tilled, the earth brought forth of its own accord as the punishment to man, thorns and thistles, that sia of the field that we see growing profusely on this day in the land of Israel after the rains. Most of us, when we hear the word weed, we think annoyance. I've got my lawn almost the way I want it, and up comes that dang dandelion, right? And the little neighbor kid goes and picks it and blows it. Ah! But for the farmer of biblical times, weeds weren't an annoyance, they were a threat and a burden. Apparently, these came after the fall, and, and so. Whenever you do have to pick weeds and dandelions, they should be a reminder of the curse and a reminder of the hope that you have of the return of Jesus when weeds and sin will be no more, right? So next time you remember, next time you're pulling weeds, remember Jesus is coming back to eradicate weeds along with your sin. So there were no weeds, there were just trees. Now now remember back on day three in chapter one, It said, God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. And it was so. Why the big focus on trees? 
Remember how I said that, that they're a good movie characters are introduced for a reason? Well, the trees are introduced this early because something's going to go down with trees. They're, they're going to be a big part, fruit trees in particular, are going to be a big part of the story. So we get to verse 9 of chapter 2, and it said, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what is it God says in verse 15 of chapter 2? The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you will surely die. Now notice the, the work and care for the garden was more like tending an orchard, not toiling the dust of the ground. That would be part of the curse. We, we looked a couple weeks ago at how the, the priests in the temple were to work and care. Those verbs are, are used again in the commissioning of the priests for the temple. It's that same language. But what I want you to see, look again with me at verse 16 of chapter 2. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. The first commandment we have in all the Bible, the first word that God gives to man as command is a permissive word. You're free. See all these trees? You can eat from all of them. That's how he, that's how, what he leads with. And then he says, except for this one. What is it about us humans that focus on what we can't have rather than what we can enjoy? What is it that entices us about the doors that say, you shall not enter or the doors that are locked? It's the doors that we can't go through that interest us far more than the doors that we can. And, and friends, this is what keeps pe many people away from God. If, if I become a Christian, that means I got to stop sleeping around. If I become a Christian, that means I got to stop getting drunk. If I become a Christian, I... That means I got to st stop lying. And, and they focus on the prohibitions rather than the blessings. They don't focus on all the freedoms and blessings they're going to have in Jesus. They, they don't focus on the benefits of being adopted by God and eternal life and forgiveness of sins and a clear conscience and a family of believers, the promise of heaven and glory. Oh, I can't sleep with anybody if I do that except for my wife or my husband. Friends, what is it about us that focuses on the things that God prohibits rather than on the freedoms and blessings that he gives us? This ends up being the downfall of humanity. Christian, you are free. Enjoy the freedom God has given you. The Bible says, he who the son is set free is free indeed. Trust God that anything he's withholding from you is either because it's not good for you or because you're not ready for it. Sin always over promises and under delivers. When, when God tells you no, it's not because God really wants to make sure you don't have any fun. No, he tells you no because sin's going to destroy you. So trust God. Trust his word. Trust that your heavenly father knows best. Isn't that what Jesus did? Unlike Adam, Jesus, the second Adam, trusted God's plan and God's word and God's timing. And he did that in another garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Unlike 
the Garden of Eden that you can't find, you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, God the Father showed his son the suffering that was coming. And what did Jesus do? He said, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And where Adam's failure to trust God was the downfall of humanity, Christ's faithful obedience, his trust in God would bring about the birth of a new humanity. The first Adam failed and disobeyed. The second Adam, Jesus, his trust would triumph. Where the first Adam rebelled and was forced to return to the ground from which he came, the second Adam would offer himself a sacrifice for sin on the cross and willingly go into the ground, into a borrowed tomb, and rest there till he arose on the third day. And that second Adam, Jesus, calls us to follow him. And the question we all have to ask ourselves is, who are we going to follow? Who, who are we going to be like? Are we going to be like our first father, Adam, who rebelled against God and thought he knew better and brought about a curse? Or are we going to follow Jesus? who entered into our curse so that we could have the promise of new life and the renewal of all things and eventually a, a better than Eden temple in glory. So who are you going to follow? Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Lord God, Help us to follow Jesus. I pray first for those listening to this morning's message who do not yet know you as they ought, who are not Christians. They, they may believe that you exist, but that you're disinterested or don't care about them or how they live. Lord, we were made by you and for you to honor you made in your image to glorify you. Would you open their eyes to see who you are and what you've done? Would you grant them the gift of faith that they might come to turn from their sin and stop modeling the life of Adam and start following Jesus? And for those of us who've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, help us to follow him at all times and in all places places. Help us to fight sin and to trust our father even more deeply. Help us to trust you in your word, your timing and your plan. And say along with our savior, Jesus, not our will, but thine be done. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to ask the worship team to come back up and we're going to close by singing Magnificent, Marvelous, Matchless Love. Get our mics. There we go. Thank you back there. Uh, you can stay with us if you'd like to. Stretch your legs.
magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exult and they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness, all life is sustained by your hand. Every meadow with color, you paint every shade in the sky. Each day the dawn wakes as an encore of magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Sing how great, how sure is love. How great, how sure. you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up the light of countenance upon you and give you his peace as you go in his grace following Jesus. God bless you. Donuts and coffee in the fellowship hall. Hope you can stay and join us for that.